we're gonna have part. We're gonna we're going to be part of a conversation with two people who have been at the heart of a struggle for solidarity on our city council since last October, when we all heard the leaked audio tapes where people who supposedly represented us expressed the most vile things about our LGBTQ plus indigenous and black neighbors, friends and family, coworkers, as they hid behind their community to hoard their personal political power, we were all disgusted and disappointed. But there's always sunlight if we look for it hard enough, right? And for me, that sunlight is by these two council members that are here. Hold on, Arita Spinnenson. Nails are cute, but they're not practical. But our guests today, council members Marquise, Harris Dawson, and Eunices Hernandez, have been living that outrage every day. They fight to right the wrongs and to think about how to enact change that leans into solidarity. Today, we will hear from them about their experience, but also their dreams for a better future. But first, I'm gonna turn it over to John Kim, President and CEO of Catalyst California, The Boss. Here we go. All right, thank you, Jessica, and the Lulu Washington Dance Theater for calling us in and setting such an amazing energy for us all. So my name is John Kim, President and CEO of Catalyst California. And on behalf of the many staff leaders and the board members here, I want to thank all of you for making it out on this beautiful yet somewhat windy day. So thank you all. Um, you know, I want to also thank Grand Performances and my buddy Rafael for coming up with this idea for us to, to collaborate on this and for helping to open up this beautiful space that's not always been built for us. Uh, and so the idea that we can kind of take it over, thank you so much, Rafael and Grand Performances. The thing that's known about Los Angeles uh, is that as a city, we don't do well in the rain. We kind of collectively freak out. We don't drive as well. Our infrastructure kind of creakingly holds together. But what's not well known is that after the rain, after a storm, this city is absolutely stunning. After a good washdown, it is one of the most beautiful cities in the entire world. I mean, look at this place. Also, look at you all. It is absolutely gorgeous. And the city has seen its fair share of storms in the past six months, as Jessica said. But we also had a divisive election where a billionaire tried to buy his way into office by stoking fear and pitting communities against one another. Those leaked tapes where craven politicos talk about communities like chess pieces and again scheming an agenda of divide and conquer for their political gain. And a righteous labor action just this week to fight for respect and equitable, sustainable wages for essential school workers. Indeed, yes. But the naysayers try to pit low-income students against low-income workers, even though we know that many are from the same families and the same communities. As it always was, the tactic of division is alive and well. It's a tactic of the smallest minds and the smallest hearts. But it's often, in the past, it's won out in LA. But that is starting to change. Despite the storms, despite the hard rain, LA is pushing through and showing up stronger and brighter than ever. We got through the mayoral race with a historic result. The first black woman mayor in our history. And boy, has she been busy. A new progressive block on our city council. And boy, have they been busy. And just recently, the historic agreement for real equitable wages and a better shot for sustainable living here in LA for 30,000 members and their families. Come on now. This didn't just happen. This transformation was intentionally crafted by thousands of leaders that have worked hard, strategized, organized for a moment like this. And we're fortunate to be joined by two of some of the brightest leaders we have uh, with us today. These are world-class organizers that have now turned to progressive electeds on the city council. So help me welcome council member Marquise Harris Dawson and council member Eunice Hernandez to the stage. Oh, I got 
got to be in the middle? Yeah, you're in the middle. All right, I'm in the hot spot. All right. Uh, okay. So thank you, council members, for making time on your weekend to sit here with us today. Um, so it's been a busy six months since the tapes. We've had protests on the streets. We've had some chaos in council. Um, and now we're seeing the city trying to move ahead and address its most pressing issues. So there are a lot that have said that those city hall tapes mark the end of multiracial solidarity in Los Angeles. What do you have to say to those critics? <laughs> I, what I have to say to those critics is that we're all better for it, for those tapes coming out. It showed us that community is stronger. You know, who pushed back the hardest when these tapes came out? It was community, protesting over and over again, protesting outside of his home, protesting down from his district office. It was community that showed the solidarity. It was Oaxacan people dancing with Black Lives Matter. That's what the, the tape showed, which was beautiful, which is the light after the storm, right? The second piece, though, it also showed us where we need to do more work where the people who were supporting some of the folks in those tapes saying they didn't do anything wrong because their lack of analysis and lens on racial equity and racial justice and what it means to be an ally, what it means to be anti-black. There are some communities that don't have that education and we also saw that pop up a little bit. So we know where we need to do some work, particularly in my community. But I think also it gave us some freedom on council to be like, nah, uh, uh you're pushing policies that are super racist. And with those tapes coming out, it gives us an opportunity to say, this falls in line, what came out of the tapes. And to bring up the tapes as examples of like, this is how the city has run, and we're gonna try to make sure that it doesn't run the same way anymore, because too many people have been left behind, and for too long, the power has been mostly in the hands of older white men. Uh -huh. Thank you. Uh, so Marquise Harris Dawson, the idea that cross-racial solidarity is over, what do you say? Well, I want to thank everybody for having us, and uh, it's, you know, it's great to be in this uh, seat on, the, on this stage. I've seen a lot of shows here, uh, n never a show that I thought I'd be a part of. So uh, congratulations to uh, Catalyst California and Grand Performances. You know, I, I agree with everything Council Member Hernandez said. The other thing I would sharpen the point a little bit, it, the, the tapes were good because they cleared the way for a progressive black, brown, poor people's alliance on the city council. We had a black, brown alliance before the tapes, but it was, it was at best a moderate alliance. Yep. It was an alliance that pitted the undeserving poor against the deserving poor. That was almost a debate every week uh, before council members Hernandez and, and Soto Martinez show up. So I, I think that you know it's an exciting time because now we have uh, a coalition on the council that looks much more like Hernandez, Ridley Thomas from the 90s than the ones that we had subsequent to that. Thank you. So we continue to see electeds like Kevin DeLeon prioritize their own ego over the needs of the city. I'm sure that's been taxing to you personally, and it's also been taxing to the efficiency, the efficacy of the city council at some points. How do you see us moving forward? Well, I, I think we'll do a few things. Obviously, redistricting will be reformed. I know Catalyst California has been fighting for that for some time, a few cycles. Literally every cycle we go through something like this. Um, you know, people forget that uh, Council President Herb Wesson was also secretly taped the last redistricting uh, cycle. So we'll, we can once and for all have an actually independent redistricting commission. But also we have to do something that looks at recall because the idea that you have to get more signatures to recall someone than you do to get someone into the United States Congress means that it's basically an inaccessible uh, tool. And so there has to be some other ways that the council can course correct when we have such a flagrant uh, display of, of incivility um, and a whole bunch of other things that, that shouldn't be in the governing body of our city. I mean, this has got to be a harder freshman year for a council member uh, than most. Uh, how do you see us moving forward? I see us moving forward by continuing to mirror what Marquise does on the floor and with the new council members and with even the existing council members, which is to bring us together to have conversations. 
It doesn't have to be a policy, but it's about vision, right? Bringing us together so we're on the same page. So we're not pushing against each other's needs for our communities, but collectively as a block, asking for the resources. So I, that's something I really admire and that you've shared that. You know, he's guided us a lot. That's been, I think, something we need to do to move out of this space, to show the solidarity, but also education. Like, people keep getting upset. Like, why aren't y'all doing anything? We've done, we've exhausted <laughs> our tools, you know? And it really is like the same process that got us elected is the same process to get him out, which is the electoral process, yeah. which is the recall process. And so I think just something that we, we can all do moving forward is better assess recall and educate people on what the tools are because that's, I mean, Marquis sits next to him, but other than that, like the, <laughs> the, 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 the toughness comes from people not understanding the predicament that we're in. Because yeah. we've done everything, and I think we've said everything, and it's yeah. a tiring conversation. That's right. We want to talk about what our vision is, what we want to see in our communities, how we want the budget to play out. So it's just been taxing in that way and yeah. be, driving away our energy. Well, we appreciate even as exhausting as that must be for you guys to keep pressing forward and the idea of us in community having to press with you. Uh, so thank you for that. You know, talking more about the structural reforms, there is a lot of conversation about independent redistricting. And this idea that the voters should be able to choose their politicians and not the other way around. There are other ideas for reforms, as you mentioned, uh, reforming the recall process. Any other ideas for structural reform? Because I know there are many people talking about it from your vantage point, though. What does it look like in terms of other kinds of viable reforms that we could be pushing? As someone who benefited from the matching funds program, I would say we need to keep exploring how to make elections publicly funded. Because when you look at the Public Safety Committee, millions of dollars went into that Public Safety Committee and those candidates. And so that's why we're getting a lot of those results. Literally, you can calculate this. And so having more candidates who have opportunities to public funds to move this forward, I think it's something we need to look to and expand. And I know there have been conversations around expanding the council, but maybe Marquis, you want to touch on that more? <laughs> yes, there are conversations <laughs> about expanding the council. And uh, I imagine those conversations will, will continue. I think the challenge with expanding the council is this. One, the idea of more politicians isn't a popular one. No. One. And then, what number is the right number? Yeah. What city can you show me that has the exact right ratio of voters to representative. Uh, and, and so I think it's a, that one's a, a tougher hill to yeah. climb and the, the vision is less clear. Yes, and if I could just add, like think about if your council mem member was just part-time. You know, this is not a part-time job and most legislators outside of here are part-time and that really serves up for inadequate service. It doesn't matter how many people you serve, even if it's just 25,000, being part-time doesn't move the work forward. I think that's also something we need to consider, like how do we have a full-time, fully established government? And so growing that number also scares me as an advocate. You know, imagine in New, like New York, I don't know how they do it because they don't even have a ballot measure process, but they have to lobby dozens and dozens of people. So both as a council member, but also as an advocate, like it's pretty hard to imagine. So it seems like uh, the idea of campaign finance reform seems less controversial which is not something that we've been in politically as a space uh, in some while, so the idea that we have cohesion there. Um, the expanding of council seats will take a little bit more work, uh, and LA City unfortunately has the ignominious uh, uh, position of being uh, having the least amount of representatives per uh, residence uh, of any city in California, so something to consider. Anything else to think about in terms of structural reform before we move on? Well, I, I can't emphasize enough the matching fund program and the public financing. I mean, this, you know, we're sitting on the stage, John, you and I, we're sitting on the stage with a giant killer, okay? The, Eunice's outraised a political giant. I mean, and this, I'm talking pre-tapes. He, he decreased in size after the tapes, but, <laughs> but, but she took out a giant because of the matching funds program. She had the capacity to be, go dollar for dollar, and even when the police union lined up with the other guy, she could contend. Yeah. Karen Bass could contend with $100 million, and not just $100 million from the guy, but another $5 million from the police union against her. She could contend with that because of our matching program. And so I think our matching program needs to be expanded, deepened, and, and made more progressive than it even is now. 
I'll say for a second, when he said giant killer, I was like, wait, I was looking over it. And yes, it makes absolute sense that we have a giant killer among us. Um, so I did want to see, like, what gives you guys hope? The, the winds are here, but the, the clouds have parted. Uh, the rain has passed. Uh, unfortunately, it's coming back again. Um, but uh, things are moving in L.A. Well, Where you, do you see racial solidarity? Where do you see it moving forward? What gives you hope? Well, you know, I think it's exciting. I, I'm as excited now as I've ever been. The day after those tapes, I, I, it was laughable to me when people said, oh, this is going to be the end of racial solidarity. Because in many ways, for me, it was the start. So when I walked into City Hall the morning after the tapes, I walked through a mariachi band in front of City Hall scream, playing music with people screaming, Kevin, get out, and Gil, get out. When I got into the council floor, I'm, on the front row is candidate Hugo Soto Martinez and council member-elect Hernandez, who were the people, by the way, who walked into the horseshoe and told Gild and Kevin, you guys got to go. Like that just, that's an only in LA story. And, and I think we have incredible possibilities in this moment because a lot of the things that were happening in the dark have come to light. And you know, the light tends to point up the things that are beautiful and drive out the things that are negative. That's right. For me, it's, uh, it's community. You know, yesterday I was at the YJC Youth Just Coalition 20 year gala. And, you know, we're doing a lot of great work, but it's community and advocacy and people that move the work forward. We're just the conduits, but the people who are actually convincing people, persuading, building people power is you all, is like organizations that we all know. And I just, that gives me hope because I know that there's, regardless of how it's happening on the inside, that community is not gonna give up because community doesn't. And so that gives me hope because it's been really challenging, you know, to transition from advocacy into legislating. Um, but it's always in those tough moments where I could call and people that I've worked with, people that we build coalitions with to say, hey, like I'm struggling with this. What, you know, what do I do? And it's community again to ground you, to remind you, yo, you're making the right decision. This decision could impact the work that we've been working on for a decade if you make the wrong one. And so that continues to give me hope in, in moments that have been very, very challenging in this space. And also people like Marquise, people like Hugo, people like Tim McCosker, like, you know, having them there, having them, you know, check in, having them give you guidance, that also gives me a lot of hope because it kind of, it, it oftentimes feels lonely in that space. But being able to have colleagues that you can check in with, that you know you're okay, you're all, you, we're, we're, we're agreeing on most things, and you can be candid with them when you know, stuff hits the fan, which it often does, that also gives me hope because camaraderie you know, is community. And so community gives me hope. Thank you. So if we could close out by just having the council members speak to the audience and those watching online, what could they do? to help this movement, to support this movement for multiracial solidarity here in LA. Any words of, of wisdom or advice? You can call everybody you know that lives in District 14, or if you live in District 14, you can encourage good people to run for that seat, and you can not just encourage them with your mouth, you can write them a check, you can volunteer to get on the phones and knock on doors and tell your friends about them, there needs to be a groundswell of support for good progressive candidates out of the 14th. The primary is 11 months away. There might even be people here who could do it. I'm just saying. All right, we're moving on from that. Okay. <laughs> Seriously, though, take note because we need better people on there with us. Yes. <laughs> so that we're a bigger block. Um, CD6 is also open. So if you haven't tapped into any races, there's still moments to knock on doors still available. That's one of the reasons why we went, why we won, is because we kept knocking doors, um, even though folks were telling us you're not going to win this. So engage in any election that's coming up. I think it's important, especially in the city. And if you're part of an organization or a coalition, and you've been doing a lot of work at the county level and state level, if you have a little bit of capacity, help us down at the city too. 
what I've noticed is that there's a big gap in like partnerships with organization, academic institutions to provide data and analysis. Oftentimes the city is just looking inwards to that and that's not a good thing to do. So if there's any capacity, help us build that, that, um, that narrative. Because I, we worked on a campaign collectively to stop a $3.5 billion jail plan. We had to persuade the Board of Supervisors. Part of that persuasion is, like you all know, creating the political landscape for it to be a good decision. And so media helps with that, narrative change helps with that, reports help with that. So I know I'm speaking to a lot of the folks that do that, that's why I'm saying it. <laughs> but we need some capacity and it's very much welcome to help us move the needle forward. Thank you so much. You don't often get elected officials calling you in like this to partner and to co-design, so we very much appreciate that. The uh, storm from the tapes has passed, the initial one, but the council is still an unfinished project. Uh, so there are ideas from these council members about how we can all continue to contribute and move that conversation forward. Uh, once again, a round of applause for the council members, please. Thank you. So the hard part about fighting structural racism is that it's not always about individual leaders. It would be easier if we could just get rid of the bad people and the system somehow worked just right for people of color, but we know that's not how it works. Um, we have to fix the underlying structures, the systems and policies that were mentioned here today. This is why I'm very excited that the Our LA Coalition, uh, Organize, Unite, Reform LA, will be partnering with elected officials to co-create the structural change, some of the ones that were mentioned here today. This is where you all come in. The RLA Coalition is gathering surveys from Angelinos all across the city to make sure that your voices are heard. And so there are QR codes up on the screens, uh, QR codes being passed out now. You can go ahead and point your phone to it, take the survey for five minutes, we'll aggregate and make sure that we have a stronger voice in City Hall as we have these structural conversations. Thank you again to the council members, thank you all, and back to you, Jessica. Thank you so much. Let's give it up again for our beautiful